Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. This afternoon, I'd like to introduce you to Jim Catan. Jim is an assistant professor in e of economics and a Challey Institute scholar at NDSU. Welcome, Jim. Hey, John. Thanks. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to share with everybody interested in the Challey Institute the work we get to do here. Uh, you know, I show up every day and I'm very happy to be here and happy to be doing research, happy to be doing teaching, and I'm, I'm glad to share that with you all. Jim, you have a lot of very interesting research related to money, finance, and monetary policy. What kinds of questions do you aim to tackle with your research? Well, you know, I think the first thing is that I want my research to be intuitive to the reader, right? So monetary policy is something that has become very complicated. Um, and I find this even when teaching my macroeconomics course, that after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, macroeconomics became very difficult to teach if you want to include the true complexity of monetary policy. Uh, so this is something that I, I aim for when I'm doing my research and when I'm teaching. Well, great. That's a good service for people to be able to understand the implications in layman's terms, let's say. So could you talk a little bit about the importance of your work for society and what kind of impact it has on society? Right. So, you know, you think of monetary policy as, as operating within the federal government, and it's an institution that's suppo supposed to, the Federal Reserve is an institution that's supposed to be serving the public. Um, and one thing that has made me uncomfortable about monetary policy in the last decade or so is that the clarity of what's actually monetary policy is doing and what's guiding monetary policy um, is greatly reduced since before 2008. So if you remember back during 2008, many people thought we were going to have hyperinflation because they didn't understand what the Fed was doing. And I would say that many people still don't understand what the Fed is doing in terms of, of operating monetary policy. So if you want to understand this distinction, uh, we can explain moving from the simple framework moving to moving to unconventional monetary policy, a more complicated framework. Um, the simple framework is what everybody has learned in their macro classes. I mean, even if you took an economics class in high school and you learned macroeconomic policy, you probably understand the basics of monetary policy before 2008. So that's to say uh, that the Federal Reserve guided monetary policies typically by expanding the quantity of money or slowing the rate of expansion of the quantity of money. Cap and you would be concerned, you know, if you expand the rate of money too much, you'd get more inflation. If you expanded the, the, the money at a slower rate, then you get less inflation. And the central bank is tasked with maintaining two goals, right? This is uh, minimizing unemployment and maintaining a low and stable rate of inflation. Uh, so monetary policy guided by those goals was simply executed through expansion of the quantity of money. Um, the way that the Federal Reserve um, was able to monitor its own progress was by watching interest rates. Okay, So if the Fed was concerned that monetary policy was too loose and they saw that inflation was becoming a problem, um, they would slow the rate of expansion of the quantity of money um, until interest rates rose sufficiently to, to make sure that the economy didn't overheat is often the term that you use. Okay, um, So monetary policy in that world is very simple. If the economy seems to be underperforming, expand the money a little bit faster. If the economy is, is running hot, slow down the rate of expansion of the quantity of money. Right? Um, there is basically speed up, slow down, and you use the interest rates to judge the stance of monetary policy. This isn't the world we live in anymore. Um, the world we live in now is much more complicated because the Federal Reserve um, will simultaneously provide money to the marketplace. They'll purchase assets in the marketplace, increasing the quantity of money, but they'll simultaneously borrow from the market. So you might have heard in your, your economics classes that the Federal Reserve is the borrower or the lender of last resort. Um, that's to say that in cases of crisis, the central bank is supposed to maintain stability, financial stability. And the way that it does that is by providing funds to borrowers in the marketplace in, in, under crisis conditions. But now, um, some say that the Federal Reserve has become the borrower of last resort, and perhaps not even of last resort. Um, and if you want to understand this picture quite clearly, uh, the Federal Reserve operates in the interbank lending market, where banks lend to one another overnight to maintain reserve levels. Well, the Federal Reserve is a net borrower from that market. And could you guess by how much the Fed is a net borrower from that market? 
we're we're talking in the range right now of 1.5 trillion dollars borrowed from the overnight lending market. Okay, wow. and that's not the only borrowing that the Fed is doing. Right, the Fed's balance sheet is over eight trillion. It is approaching nine trillion dollars right now. Right, and so most of that value of the balance sheet, that nine trillion dollars, is offset by Fed borrowing. Right, so we have um, the quantity of money circulating is in, in the two and a half to three uh, trillion range right now, um, and the Fed is borrowing the rest of that balance to, from the market. If you if you look at the percentage of the Fed's investments, about seventy five percent of those investments are offset by Fed borrowing. Mm. So why is the Fed doing this? You might ask. This is how monetary policies run now. Well, uh, you know, Benjamin Bernanke during the crisis of 2008 decided um, that the old way of doing monetary policy, that's expanding the quantity of money at a faster or slower rate, depending on the state of uh, the financial markets at the time, he decided that that was not the best way to do monetary policy. Instead, uh, he thought the best way to do monetary policy was to provide liquidity to markets that he was concerned about. Okay, so remember it was the real estate markets in, in 2008. So Benjamin Bernanke decided that it'd be best for the Federal Reserve to lend to banks that he thought needed, needed the capital most, the ones that were most in danger. And, and that ultimately turned into investment in sectors that the Federal Reserve to be the most appropriate. So be, before 2008, the Federal Reserve was investing in U.S. Treasuries, which means it was lending to the government. That was his prim primary mode of implementing monetary policy. The Federal Reserve expands the quantity of money by supporting government borrowing. It was, it was, it was the standard framework. After 2008, uh, the Federal Reserve has been much more involved in mortgage markets. Um, and so now, you know, the Federal Reserve at any time since the crisis has tended to hold more than 10% of U.S. mortgages. Um, and this, uh, in the recent crisis, after the recent COVID-19 financial crisis that we were potentially facing, has led to a lot more borrowing in mortgage markets because we have record low mortgage rates. So the Federal Reserve now can target particular interest rates in particular financial markets. It can favor, basically move resources from one market to another depending on whether or not it thinks that market ought to receive support. Um, so the Fed has a more complicated tool set because it wants to be able to steer resources in the directions that it thinks is most appropriate. Yeah, that's very interesting, and it sounds like your job has become a lot more complicated of trying to <laughs> explain macroeconomic concepts to students, so it's so very interesting. I'm wondering, are there additional questions that you would like to tackle in the future? Well, you know, I'm dealing right now, um, and this ties directly to uh, trying to understand monetary policy. Um, part of my task is to understand the perspective of the monetary policy, the, the maker of monetary policy. So that is Benjamin Bernanke, and that's the more recent Fed, uh, Federal Reserve chairs. Um, and so one means by which I do this is I, I step into the mind of the policymaker. I look at the work that they were doing, right? Benjamin Bernanke, he became famous doing work on the Great Depression. And in that work, he says that the, the, the primary risk um, that ended up being the problem for the economy was that large financial institutions collapsed. So you can see, if that's Benjamin Bernanke's prime concern, it's not a coincidence that in the 2008 financial crisis, the buzzword was that, that we had institutions that were too big to fail. That's a direct result of Benjamin Bernanke's perspective that he was implementing. Um, so if you would have been a, a follower of Benjamin Bernanke in 2007, say, you wouldn't have been surprised that monetary policy transformed in this direction in particular. right? And I can give you another example from the same person, Bernanke, um, who at the time was very concerned about maintaining low inflation and low inflation expectations throughout the crisis. Okay, and even before the crisis, um, Benjamin Ber Bernanke was less comfortable with, say, a rate of inflation that was, say, three, four percent on average, um, and, and more interested in maintaining one that was, was lower. Um, and even in the short run, didn't want to ever risk leading investors to think there'd be higher inflation expectations. And so part of the reason why monetary policy transformed was because this idea of expanding the money stock and potentially generating more inflation made him very uncomfortable. So instead, he, he, he chose to provide support to particular lenders, but prevent the money from circulating in the economy. 
Or in other words, he didn't want the new money created to generate inflation. Okay, you can't understand that unless you step into the research of Benjamin Bernanke. Um, this is why it's very important, especially in this, this, this world where experts are sort of reigning over policy, um, for people to be familiar with the work that's guiding the experts that are guiding policy. If we don't understand that, then we can't understand how they're transforming our social reality. Well, that's great, and I think that's a perspective a lot of people don't take, like you said, and that's really important. So that's, this has really been great to be able to sit down with you and talk about your research, learn more, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you find out in the future, so thanks. Thank you. Well, I look forward to stepping into the office tomorrow and coming back each day. Sounds good.